This, uh, this week I'd like to talk about evangelism, uh, preparing ourselves for the next two weeks and just reminding ourselves of what we do, why we do uh, during the summer when we have our fairs and other things. Uh, the fair work, of course, that we do is just uh, one way to do evangelism and it's one opportunity. So we do that not only to evangelize and minister to other people, but to provide us the opportunity to exercise our ministry muscles. As we talked about this morning, uh, we come together for the purpose of edifying each other. And that word means to build up and strengthen each other. We're a building in the body of Christ. And so we do that through teaching right doctrine, through seeing and encouraging each other, through the conversations and support we give one another. And yet the exercise of the ministry that God would have us do as ambassadors, to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, to see all men saved, to come knowledge of the truth, the exercise of that happens outside of our meetings uh, where we can speak to people truth. Right? And so that is an opportunity at the fairs to do that. Of course, it's not the only opportunity. So why are we at the county fairs? Uh, this answer is simple. Evangelism. And that's necessary. Okay, it's necessary for church growth. It's necessary, and by church, I don't mean grace ambassadors, all that's included. I mean the body of Christ growth. It's people saved that way. It's necessary. It's necessary for Christ himself to be known and declared. And so evangelism is a necessary thing we do, and so it's important we have that as part of our ministry. Of course, the word evangelism, if you look it up in your concordance, actually does not exist anywhere in the Bible. To those of you who are, are a little timid about it, have that as justification. Well, the word's not in the Bible anywhere, so why should I do it? But the concept is all over the place. Okay? And the concept of evangelism may be different than what other churches have made it to be. Okay? It seems like people have changed the idea of evangelism to be simply an outreach to their community. Have you heard this kind of type of talk? Outreach to the community? That has replaced what used to be called evangelism. Because evangelism sounds like too preachy. It's too imposing. It's going to be too confrontational. It's going to be too verbal even. And so you've heard the saying that we're going to preach the gospel and if necessary use words, right? That's the people, thing people throw around. What's well, their concept of evangelism? How do you preach the gospel? Well, with our lifestyle, with our behavior, uh, with the way we treat one another, right? That's, that's their evangelizing and, and preaching Christ to the world. That's different, however, than what the Bible says. Because evangelism is not, it doesn't have the goal of trying to gather people together. That's not evangelism. It's not that we're saying the pews are empty, we need to go out and beat the bushes and gather people together. That's not evangelism. Okay? Even though we would like to have more people attend and we would like to see more people saved so we can do a ministry, that's not the goal of evangelism, to gather people together. If the goal was to simply gather people together and attract them to a group, then the way we do evangelism would be different. Right? We would not have the boards and the signs that we have on the back wall in our booth. Right? The things that sometimes provoke the things that sometimes, we read this morning, some of the email responses, sometimes they provoke to, to, to offense. Okay? And that wouldn't be the way we do it if we're trying to gather more people together. If you're trying to have a big tent, if you're trying to have as many people as you can get together in, in the name of the church, then we ought to try to attract them a different way than the gospel. Because people have been killed by preaching the gospel, people have been persecuted by preaching the gospel, and doctrine, of course, divides. And so it's, it's not the best way to gather people together. It is, however, the truth. And that's what we've been called to preach. That's what we've been called to do. A lot of people consider evangelism as simply meeting the needs of the flesh. So the idea, again, of, uh, you, if necessary, using words. You know, that, that's trying to portray the importance of our actions. And so Christians evangelize or outreach by actions. So the more we show love in our actions to people, this is a type of evangelism. Or perhaps the way attracting people to church is a good thing that people think, that just being in church is a proper thing. We dealt with that a little bit this morning, and I wrote about it yesterday in my article, that people have the idea that just being at church is, is good. If you're just in this building, if you're in church, if you're involved in what they do, somehow God is going to look down from heaven and say, well, if you're in this acreage, then you get blessing poured out on you. right? Or if you're a part of a church, you get special blessing as if you were not. And it's really nowhere found in Scripture unless you're under Israel's religion, Israel's law, and the temple there. Okay, the church, the body of Christ, is not a building, it's not a place, it's a people who believe a message about Jesus Christ being the Savior. Okay, but if we're trying to attract people to a certain place, then you lay out the cheese. That's all you got to do, right? That's how you collect the mice, you, you lay out the cheese. Or as people have told me before, you collect more flies with honey. All right, let's lay out the honey, and you'll get a bunch of flies. What happens if you get rid of the honey? The flies go away, right? 
And, and so are we really wanting flies? It is our message honey? Is that the question? People try to attract lots of people for different reasons. Uh, they'll have uh, games and food and music. A lot of people go to churches, and churches are growing because of the concerts they put on. This is the new thing uh, the last 15, 20 years, is that the, the church is now the place where you can exercise and practice your musical abilities, and churches now have music publishing companies within the churches. And so music is an attraction. Who doesn't like a good concert? So invite your friends to a concert, and guess what? This concert is actually a church. Unbelievable. It's amazing. This is the best church I've ever seen. And look at the speakers and the, the big screens and all that. And so the music attracts people. Okay? Um, games attract people. And I include in games the programs and the different things that people provide for family, whether it be the church softball team or basketball team or the church daycare program and this sort of thing, which are not bad in themselves. These aren't evil things, right? But they, churches have these things in part in order to attract more people. The issue with doing it this way, of course, is all of these are meeting needs of the flesh. And, and again, we live in the flesh. There are needs that need to be met in the flesh, and they are met by these things. But if you're going to attract people with the needs of their flesh, what happens when you stop meeting the needs of their flesh? They don't need you anymore. You see, the function of the church at that point has changed. So our evangelism is not trying to meet people's needs in their flesh. You can do that, and it's great and noble, and it's helpful, and it, and, and it meets people's needs. But the need that we're uh, primarily and essentially told and commissioned to perform is meeting people's spiritual needs. Okay, because the church is unique and given the responsibility to hold this, the truth of God's word, the spiritual truth, the spiritual realities. And so we need to be knowledgeable about that, equipped with that, and our message is about the importance of that. That way, when you attract people, or when you evangelize, which would be the better word instead of attract, when you evangelize and proclaim and preach the spiritual understanding and truth that we, we get from God's word, when people hear that and they see their need of it, they see that that's true and they believe it, now they're attracted to spiritual truth. They're attracted to God's word. They're attracted to Jesus Christ. So that it doesn't matter if you have a good basketball team or not, they're here for truth. Simply said, what you attract people with is how you're going to lose them. Okay, is the idea. So our evangelism method, the way we do it, is not having a booth at the fair and giving out all sorts of fleshly things. I mean, we can just have a pizza oven there and just give out free pizza to people. We'd have the, the hottest booth in the building, right? And uh, we don't mention Christ at all. We don't try to minister the gospel, and it's going to be a vain effort. Okay, and there, there are folks that do that, that, that anything they can to try to get people to come out to church, anything they can to get your name on a mailing list, right? And that's not our method, Right? But we do need to evangelize. Evangelism requires words. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15. A lot of good things done in the world that, you, that are good works that you should participate in that, are not the, that is not the ministry of the church. Okay? A lot of churches have lost that. A lot of the evangelism you see in there are some 35% of churches that are growing now, according to the recent surveys, which is up 15%. So apparently church, more churches are growing now than they were. Um, but you wonder how they're growing. Because I'm not seeing a great increase of biblical understanding. You see, so how, how is it happening that they're growing? Well, there's lots of ways to gather people and to grow institutions. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 and 11, if I get the right page here, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You've got to understand some things there about who you are, right? And there's no other message I can think of that's more relevant, if you want to use the word of the 1990s, to our culture today than your identity, right? Who you are. Am I this? Am I that? Right? Well, the Bible says, by the grace of God, you are what you are. And so we have a say in the fight, which is who you are in Christ. And without him, you're something else something else that may not be good, may not be who God made you to be. In Christ, you are who God made you to be. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul here is talking about evangelism, his evangelistic work. By the grace of God, Paul was saved, and by the grace dispensed to him, he labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God was in me. Notice how Paul there attributes the work in him to the grace of God. That's because of Galatians 2.20, that work crucified with Christ. 
And so every motivation you have to come to the knowledge of the truth, to preach the truth to others, is God's grace working in you? Because without Christ in you, who would care? <laughs> you wouldn't care. I wouldn't care. Who cares? But that you care, that's God's grace working in you. That's God working in you. You see, that you have a, a love for the truth of this book and the seeing souls saved. But Paul says here, in verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, notice these next three words, so we preach. You see, the, the method through which people hear the truth is by preaching. And you say, well, I'm not a preacher. You're the preacher. But you misunderstand preaching. Paul's not saying here, that's why we get up on Sundays behind a pulpit and start lecturing you. That's not what he's saying. Preaching is what you do naturally. When you try to tell me why the Lakers are better than the Golden State Warriors. I mean, that's what preaching is. You're trying to convince me of this, right? That's preaching. Only here we're supposed to preach what? God's grace. God's word. So we preach and so ye believe. So the result of the preaching is believing. You have people who did not believe before. Now they believe because Paul preached God's grace. That's evangelism. See, the concept is here. You have to use words. Without the preaching, there is no believing. Believing in what? Right? Well, I came here with the free food. That's not believing anything. I came here because it's a good daycare. You're not believing anything. Yeah, well, I guess since I'm here, I might as well be a believer. Believe in what? I don't know. You can't unless you hear a message, believe. Okay, you have to have an object of your faith, and the faith is Jesus Christ. And so look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Here's going to be the theme text for this morning. Philippians 1, verse 7. The goal of evangelism. The goal is souls saved. In Philippians 1, verse 7, it tells us the function of evangelism, which we'll talk about this morning. You see, what else is between a function and a goal? Well, only this. You have a car. What's the function of a car? The drive, transport. Right? That's the function. That's what it does. You turn the key and it moves. Right? But what's the goal of a car? You have a car, what, just to move? Well, some people may, you know, but the goal typically is to get to a place. That's the goal. That's the result, right? I have a car for the function of driving for the goal of getting somewhere, right? That's, that's how that works. So you evangelize, and when you evangelize using the words, the gospel, the grace of God, the goal is that people believe, right? The goal is that Christ be proclaimed, this will help you, by the way, when you realize you're preaching and no one's believing. You say, well, what good is it? Well, you've also reached another goal, which is proclaiming Christ, which cannot happen without words, right? If all your preaching does your entire life is not get one soul saved, but rather proclaims Christ, you have done what God has told you to do. He wants you to be the witness, the ambassador of his message to a world that rejects him. So if the world rejects you, you're preaching the message, you're doing your responsibility, our goal, of course, is for them to be saved, and they will if you do it with the right heart, with the right message. Okay? But what's the function of evangelism? Just like the car, the function is to drive. What's the function of evangelizing? Well, Philippians 1 verse 7 tells us what the function is. What, is, what, are, you, what are you doing when you evangelize? Well, I go up to someone and say, do you believe Jesus Christ? Right? Is that what it is? You get the, the, the placard around your chest and walk around, the end is near, you're going to die, you know. What's the fun? How do you actually do it? Well, when is it when you say, I'm doing evangelism? What, when does that point happen? Right? Do you know Jesus? Anybody ever heard this question asked of them? Not many, maybe some. You know. Is that evangelism? What is the function? What are you trying to accomplish? What happens after you ask the question? Do you know Jesus? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's next? What do you do? Anybody not know what to do to evangelize? Anybody is scared of what to say and how to say? This is a common fear. I have a list here of nine reasons why people don't evangelize, and one of them is they don't know how. What does that even mean? What's the function? How do I know I'm doing it? If you get in a car, and it's not going anywhere, you're not using the car. Maybe for a home, I don't know. <laughs> you're not using it towards intended function. The function is to go, right? You see, I've got a car in my front yard, it ain't going anywhere. Well, that's not, that's not using the car. It's not a flower pot. You know, it's, it's to drive. What's the goal of evangelism? You know, well, I need to throw tracks at people. Tracks are very useful and they're very handy, especially when you don't know what to say. So I don't know what to say. Well, good thing about printed material is that the words are already there. 
You just have to give it to someone. Right? But there's a function to doing this. I mean, it's 1 verse 7, Paul says, It is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Paul has a heart for the Philippians, because why? Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. Paul had a heart for the Philippians. He loved the Philippians because of these things here. He says, when I'm in prison, you guys sought out my benefit. The Philippians, I think, wrote to Paul or sent to Paul because Philippians 4 talks about how Paul received what they sent. Paul was in jail when he wrote this epistle, and they, he received what they sent to him. So he says, in my bonds, you're, you're partaking of my grace. You, you are with me. You're supporting me, encouraging me in my bonds. So he says, I, I love you guys. And he also says, not only in my bonds, but in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, which is interesting. What is he talking about there? That's what Paul does in his ministry. Paul's an evangelist. He's an apostle. He's out ministering to people. He's going from town to town ministering, right? You read the book of Acts? Well, what's he doing? He's defending and confirming the gospel. That is evangelism. So what I'm proposing here this morning is the function of evangelism is to defend and confirm the gospel, the result of which is souls saved and Christ proclaimed. This is what you're actually doing. You're trying to do this by doing this, defending and confirming the gospel. Now, what is that? Well, this is what we're going to study this morning. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2. 2 Thessalonians 3. <clears throat> when we go to the fairs and we go out and do ministry work, go to door to door, however we do that, your conversations with people, your friends and, and family that don't attend here, and uh, you're, you're talking to them about the truth, there's a wide array of beliefs and ideas that people have about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, about Christianity. It's a battle of ideas. There's a marketplace. Choose which church you want to go to, right? You need to be an option, right? The gospel of the grace of God needs to be an option. And it won't be unless first there are people who believe it and understand it and know it and can and explain it. You can be, that's why we meet here, to equip you so that you can explain and understand what you believe, first of all, and benefit from the truth, but so you can explain it to others as well, because you can't explain it unless you first understand it and know and experience it. So your explanation, your preaching, your ministry of it to other people is you engaging in the battle place, in the marketplace of ideas, competing with other thoughts about who you are, where did we come from? How do we get saved? What is the number one problem in humanity? Do we need a Savior at all? And who is the Savior? These are questions our culture asks. Maybe not in those words, but they ask those questions. Everyone wants a Savior. That word sounds too churchy, so they replace it with, we need someone to give us the right policies. We need someone to fix our nation's issues. You know, what are you saying? You're saying you need a Savior? No, I'm not churchy. Well, that's what you're saying. So that's all you have to do is interpret what they're thinking, because you have the same thoughts. But the fence that people try to sit on is really thin. There's, there, there's not room on the fence of faith for people to sit there and say, I'm not on either side. Impossible. You either believe something or you don't. Okay? And this is where you come in with evangelism. Because you can't sit on the fence of faith. You can't say, well, I just don't believe in that stuff. Well, you've not believed it. You're on one side of the fence, right? You can't be agnostic about believing. You either do or you don't. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, Paul says in verse 1, Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. Free course, what does that mean? That when we preach it, it may be received, it may go to, hear, to people's ears and not be stopped. Free course, right? It may go freely, and it may be glorified, even as it is with you, Thessalonians received it and believed it, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. In those two verses, you see both sides of the fence. The Thessalonians, who believed what Paul was preaching, and you saw the fruits of it in the Thessalonian church. They were sounding it out. They were bearing the fruits of the Spirit in one of the, the, the most praised churches in Paul's ministry, Thessalonian church. Okay? So he says, pray that the, the gospel that we preach, the ministry we have, have free course, as it is with you. He says, and pray that we be delivered from, who does he say we delivered from? Unreasonable men. Okay, unreasonable men. Reasonable? 
We talked just last week about the use of reason in, in our knowledge, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, because if men do not hear the truth, do not believe the truth, if what you're preaching is truth, they are being unreasonable, right? Or are we just playing around? Is it your opinion? Is it just your suggestion? Or is this God's truth in a book that you understand? And if that's true, when you tell it to someone and they do not believe, remember, there's no fence setting here. You either believe it or you don't. And if you don't believe it, you're being unreasonable. Now, Paul's not telling this to their face. He's telling the Thessalonians. But unbelie unbelievers, unreasonable people, hinder the reception of the gospel. Right? He calls them wicked because what do you call someone who's contrary to the truth? You see, I know a lot of good people, a lot of good friends that are unbelievers. Good. Because you were once too. You're not born one. Right? You've got to hear the message and believe it. But those who don't believe, just like you were before you believed, were unreasonable because you didn't know the truth, and you're wicked. Understand what the words mean. Get past the ad hominem. Get past the personal offense. What does wickedness mean? It's something contrary to truth. And if I'm preaching truth and you're contrary to it, I love you. I want to help you. I want you to know the truth. That's why I'm preaching to you. But it's wicked not to believe the truth. You see, this is the difference between believers and unbelievers. There's no fence here. There's no saying, well, they're not unreasonable and they're not wicked, but they're not believers. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's unreasonable. Okay. And so in these two verses, you see the extremes. And I'm saying even as it gets closer to the fence, it's going to lead one of, the, one of those paths. Either that little bit of faith you have is going to grow towards faithfulness, or that little bit of disbelief you have is going to grow towards resistance and opposition to the truth entirely. That's the two sides of the issue. Evangelism is you engaging in the battle to defend against the opposition and confirm to those who have faith. Right? Because even though some have faith, not all are strong in their faith. Right? And even though some resist the truth, not all are fully persuaded in their resistance. So you can defend the truth to them and perhaps you'll convince them of it. Right? So we need to do that. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. Paul says, As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Resist the truth. This is what you will face when you evangelize. You either have people that believe or that don't believe. Different degrees but if they're going to believe or they're not going to believe, that's, that's what you're facing. Okay? If they don't believe, you need to detect this or understand this or hear what they're saying and know that they are opposing it, in which case you need to defend. If you're talking to someone who does believe, right? Maybe they don't rightly divide, they don't know the gospel clearly, but they say, I believe, I want to know. Now you need to confirm. This is what evangelism does. Defends and confirms the gospel. 23.8 simply defines for us that those who resist the truth are those who do not have faith. Right? Our goal is to get people to hear the word and have faith so that we can be saved. Titus 1 verse 11, or Titus 1 verse 1 rather, says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, which acknowledging and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after God and godliness. Paul says the faith of God's elect, those who have faith, right? Acknowledge truth. What's the difference between the believers and the unbelievers, those with faith and without faith? Well, what's their response to truth? Do they believe it or don't? If they don't believe it, then they are opposing it and resisting it. If they do believe it, they're acknowledging it. Okay, that's the difference. You see, it sounds pretty simple, Justin. Yeah, but evangelism is pretty simple. I'm trying to simplify this issue here. Evangelism defends truth against the faithless and confirms truth in those that believe. What's it mean to have a defense? Look at Romans eleven twenty eight. The defense in football. Maybe I'll teach some of you rules of football this morning. The defense in football are trying to guard their end zone from the offense. That is what they're doing. Okay. So I thought they were just tackling people. Oh yeah, but they're they're defending their end zone. If the other team gets into the end zone, they've conquered their territory, right? So they're defending, that's why they're the defense. What are they defending? Their end zone. 
the offense is trying to attack and get in their end zone, right? Your end zone, your possession is truth, gospel, God's word. And for those who don't believe it, it is under constant attack. What is the Christian response to this? Evangelism. To defend. You're playing defense. You gotta defend it. It's your possession. God's given it to you. You believe it. You need to grow up in it. Be knowledgeable about it so that you can defend it. Okay? Just like if you do not understand what you believe, it's questionable whether you believe at all. <laughs> if you don't know what it is you believe. Likewise, if you can't defend what you believe, it's questionable whether you're strong in your faith. You say, well, I don't know if I can defend what I believe. Well, that's fine. That's why we have church, to grow and strengthen and edify one another. But if you can't defend it, maybe you're on weak territory. Maybe you have faith and you're saved, but I'm just, I'm a leaf in the wind, you know. Well, let's, let's root you down. Let's get you grounded so that you can defend what you believe, right? This is how you do evangelism. One way you do it, against opposition. Because the world is in opposition to it. People are in opposition to it. We read all the time how they question God's word, right? They live contrary to God's word. Even Christians doubt God's word, which tells you there's a lot of weak Christians, if they're Christians at all, right? Defense is a resist of an attack from the enemies. Romans eleven twenty eight. 28, after three chapters of Paul explaining what happened to Israel and how they fell and how they rejected faith in Jesus Christ when he came to minister to them in the red letters, Romans eleven twenty eight 28 says about Israel, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. It says God chose Israel. The election in the Bible always refers to either one or two things, Israel or Jesus Christ. The word election refers to those. God's choice and purpose, his choice was the nation of Israel, and he chose Jesus Christ, his anointed one. So you're either in Israel or you're in Christ, according to the body of Christ. There's the two, only two options in the scripture. Right? Romans 11.28 says, Israel, who has fallen and rejected Christ by faith, they are the enemies of the gospel. But Paul's point in the chapter is that that's why we need to preach the gospel to them, so they can have faith. Right? It says in Galatians 4.16, the whole book of Galatians chapter 4, the reason why Paul sounds so fiery in that epistle, Galatians, is because the Galatians are believing a doctrine that is contrary to truth. What's that make them? Enemies of the gospel. And so the whole book of Galatians, you want to know what it sounds like to defend the truth? Read Galatians. Paul's defending it. In Galatians 4.16, he says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Right? So Paul's acknowledging what you're saying and what the truth is saying are different, right? He's, he's doing a form of evangelism. He's, he's growing these people, right? And he's trying to convince them, persuade them to defend the truth against the error the Galatians have fallen into, that the law was necessary to keep for you to have a spiritual position in Christ. And Paul says, that is wrong. He says, I'm scared of you, Galatians 4. And he goes on, he calls them foolish Galatians and everything else, trying to defend the truth from the scripture. Okay. In Philippians 3, Paul sheds tears. Even though defense, uh, defending the truth is, uh, is a resisting the attack from enemies, and you are in a battle, in a battle of ideas, a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. You're not punching people in the face. You're not shooting people down. It's ideas, what people believe. It's truth. Words. Okay. And even though we're in that battle, Ephesians 6 gives us the armor for that battle and says, fight the good fight of faith and all of that. We're not against the people, right? Because you were once like that as well. Being ignorant is what we're born as. We're all trying to learn the truth. It's no, no benefit that you learned it before someone else, right? It doesn't make you special in that regard. And so we evangelize against these, uh, against these attacks in order for them to know the truth. We want their benefit. That's what charity is all about. And Paul Philippians 3.18 weeps for those who walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay. There's a difference between a weak Christian and someone who's contrary to truth. Okay. Sometimes people wonder, you know, well, how do I know how to respond to people more hard or more soft? Well, it depends who you're dealing with. This is why evangelism, you need to have that discernment. Are, are they attacking truth? Are they standing in opposition to truth? And therefore, you need to defend the truth? And draw the line and say, am I your enemy? Are we, are, are we fighting here? Or are they just weak in the knowledge of the truth? 
and rather you need to confirm in them and establish in them. See, that's the different approaches you have to it. Philippians 3.18, Paul's weeping for these people, saying they're enemies because he's tried to deal with them and tried to talk with them, and yet they consistently resist and oppose the truth. They, and Paul tries to defend the truth for them, but they won't have anything of it. So they're enemies. Right? Never make yourself an enemy of the truth. Right? You can be an enemy of the truth even as a saved person because you get to a point where you're following your flesh and you resist the truth and you don't have anything to do with it. Always hold to the truth. Before me, before you, before the, the church at large, the truth is the truth. You follow the truth where it leads. Let God be true. Right? This is the Bible's teaching. Never make yourself an enemy of the truth, wherever it's at. Colossians 1.21, Paul says that, says you are enemies of God before he reconciled you. So we were all enemies of God at one point. And we all had to hear the word preached, and we heard it, what it was doing was defending the truth against the errors you had believed before. And it was teaching you things you didn't know before, so that you believed it. And maybe you got saved when you first believed it. And maybe after you got saved, you heard some more defense of the truth, some more confirmation of it, and you started to grow in it. That's evangelism work. That's preaching the message. Okay? Evangelism is simply declaring the message. That's what it means. Evangelist. Doing the work of evangelist. What about confirmation? Look at Philippians 1 verse 14. Since evangelism is, is, de is defense and confirmation, well, yeah, because it depends on who you're talking to. What's confirmation? Well, we had a language lesson a couple weeks ago. Do we have another one here? When you start learning different languages, it really helps you appreciate yours. And so... Uh, me and my wife talk about languages, and I have to explain to her what different English words mean, and it's great to be able to go through this. You see in the word confirmation or confirm, the English word firm, right? And this prefix con. What's con mean? Together. It can mean against, right? And in this way, it means together or with. Kind of like, uh, uh, I always use chili con carne example, you know, with meat con carne, it's, it's Spanish for with meat, with or together. Firm means hard, strengthened, strong, unmovable, right? If it's firm, it's stuck there. You're strong together, making something strong together, confirm, right? When you plant the seed, when you, when you first believe, you are not strong. <laughs> you may believe, and that's great, and you're happy and excited, but you need to be confirmed. Firm. This is why Catholic religion has a confirmation process. This is they get it from Scripture, right? We're going to teach you our doctrines to confirm you in our religion. Because if you don't, they're going to go to somewhere else, right? Well, the idea is not bad. It's from the Scripture. It's just what they're confirming in you is wrong. But confirmation means strengthening you or making you firm together. In Philippians 1.14, Paul uses the word embolden or, or making bold. And he says, his bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident. Confident. That word there means with faith. Bide, faith, confident. I have faith. Faith in what? Myself. I'm confident. Right? People who are not confident have no faith in themselves. They're just insecure. Right? I, I have no confidence. Well, you need, you need strengthened. Let me confirm something. You can do it. You know the gospel. You know God's word rightly divided. You know enough scripture to confirm truth in other people. You know enough of the gospel to defend it against simple attacks like law. I mentioned Galatians. You know what I'm talking about. You can do it. Building confidence. But Paul says, my bonds, the fact that I was preaching, defending, and confirming the gospel, and they threw me in jail for it. He says, some of the brethren have gained confidence because of this. Why would that be? Because look what Paul's doing. He's sacrificing stuff. He's, he's got thrown in jail. This is what happens in our country, too, on different issues, not just religion. Politics as well. You see some Christian baker get persecuted or something, right? What do Christians do everywhere? Defend the Christian! You know, <laughs> Suddenly Christians start yelling about you know, which side they're on. Well, before they ever bought cakes at that guy's store, but now <laughs> they're in confidence, right? We're going to fight. Well, okay. I mean, cakes is one thing. Why not the gospel, Right? 
Why not embolden people with the gospel so that when you are strengthening yourself and you defend and confirm and take a stand for the gospel of Christ, someone else looks at you and goes, that guy's doing the right thing. Yeah, let's do that. Right? Philippians 1.14, Paul says, Many are waxing confident by my bonds and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. See, the problem wasn't that they didn't know the word. They already knew the word. They were just afraid. They were afraid to speak it. Evangelism, to get from here to here, requires... Boldness, right? Confidence. Strength for you to go from here to actually do it. You could be sitting in the car saying, yeah, I should evangelize, I should evangelize, I should evangelize. And until you turn that key and hit the gas pedal, which is a scary thing if you've never done it before. Right? Parents go, yeah, I remember when I tried to teach my kids that. You know, Run into a bush, run off the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. That's what's going to happen. But, you know, if you don't drive, you're never going to get anywhere. And if you never preach, you defend and confirm the gospel, you're never going to see a soul saved or Christ proclaimed. Never going to happen. And if not, you, then who? Right? You know the gospel of grace more clearly than most any church in town. In fact, I would say any church in town. You can proclaim it more clearly. Because you rightly divide. There's no confusion in you about whether the Hebrew epistles apply to the gospel. There's no confusion in you about where the law applies to grace. You understand how to, how to discern the difference. You are able you can do it. You can have confidence to defend and confirm, and you will see results. One of the two, right? Say, no one's going to believe me. Well, you don't know. They have to believe. You can't make them. But at least Christ will be proclaimed. There'll be a voice, an option, an alternative, and perhaps by your bonds, perhaps by them hearing your voice, they'll wax confident. And more people will say, yeah, that is clear. That's the clearest presentation I've ever heard. Maybe I'll preach that way too. Great. I'm a Baptist. Well, preach the clear gospel, would you? And maybe by our engagement, our evangelism, other people will be encouraged. This happens at the fairs all the time. Madison County Fair last year, we were the only church booth, apart from Jehovah Witnesses, who is a cult. Right? The only church booth. And Christians would walk by, and they would say, we're glad you're here. <laughs> good. Let's talk. <laughs> you know, but good. Christians should not be ashamed of the gospel. We know this, but we hardly ever practice it. And evangelism and your participation in it. You say, what's that mean? It means simply your ability to defend and confirm the gospel. Your evangelism, opportunities that you take, will embolden other Christians. That's your job, folks. That's your job. To preach a message so that Christ is proclaimed and other people are emboldened by it. Right? Confirmation, to make strong, to make firm. You can't defend anything until you're first strengthened. You can't confirm anything unless you first know it, right? Sometimes churches say, well, you're newly saved, go out and evangelize someone. You know, well, if you know the gospel, you can tell them the gospel. I'm nothing against that. If you're saved and you know the gospel, you can tell it to someone else. You can tell them what you know. As much as in you is, Paul says in Romans 1, you can do that. You don't have to defend every question. You don't have to confirm every truth. All of us are learning truth all the time from the scripture. We don't know it all. But what you know, someone else can benefit from. And so you can confirm and defend even from the day you're saved. But you're going to face stronger opposition, right? You're going to face Christians that are just as weak as you. So the stronger you get, the more you're able to aptly confirm and defend. The more you're able and equipped to do that. And that's why we exercise so hard here in God's truth. So that when you're facing the winds of resistance, when you're facing the winds and the masses of weak Christianity, you can stand. And it's easy. Because we do that all the time when we practice at Grace Ambassadors. You can't defend something until you're strengthened. If you're not strengthened, you're going to fold like a paper sack. You're going to get out there and try to evangelize, and the first time someone says something back to you, you're going to go, oh, I don't know. But you do know. You can know. Look at Acts 14. Let's see some examples of Paul doing this. What I'm describing here is the Pauline pattern of evangelism, but what it means. It's an active verbal thing you're doing. A lot of people are just scared to talk to people that they don't know. This is terrifying. There's a solution for that, which we'll deal with a little bit later. But Acts 14, 22, look what Paul does. <clears throat> Verse 21 says, When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And what were they doing when they returned to Iconium and Antioch and Lystra? They had already preached there. I mean, they were already saved. They are already Christians, right? Move on. Go to another town. They went back there. Why? Verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. 
You see, because you tell them once and they believe, praise God, if you don't confirm them, that young plant, it's going to fall right over and ain't going to bear any fruit. And Paul goes back and confirms the souls and he exhorts them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. So he's trying to help, help them be able to resist opposition. Right? Confirming truth in them. You see his action there in Acts 14? Defending and confirming? He's doing those. Acts 15 verse 32 does the same thing here. Well, not Paul here specifically, but Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So here's Judas and Silas going back to Antioch, to the Gentiles, where Paul ministered. And there were Judas and Silas were sent from Jerusalem in order to confirm to these Gentiles that you don't have to keep the law to be saved. That was the whole debate in Acts 15. And so after this conclusion in Acts 15, Judas and Silas go back to the Gentiles and they exhort them and confirm them, strengthen them, because there was confusion. I mean, these guys are saying I've got to be circumcised. Paul's saying I don't. What's the issue? Paul went to Jerusalem, settled the issue, and these guys came back and confirmed and said, nope, don't have to keep the law. Paul's right. Follow him. Right? The confirmation of the truth. You will face people at the fairs, in community, in your conversations that are Christians. They say so. Right? Now, it's your job to figure out <laughs> how strong they are, if they are at all. Right? But it may be your job in ministry isn't just, hey, do you know Jesus? Because maybe you get the idea, since they go to church or something, that they, they would say yes to this question. But it's to confirm them in the truth. It's to strengthen them. And you can do that outside the church. That's part of evangelism. Okay. In Acts 15, 41, you see Paul and Silas. Here, they went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. He's trying to strengthen them. If Paul just took one journey to the churches, got him saved, and said, see you later, have a good time, right? they would not have probably lasted. Paul confirms. In 1 Corinthians 1, 6-8, Paul tells the Corinthians that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Okay, Confirmation is needed for the weak. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. This is our, this is our ministry responsibility here. Those of you who are strong... Everyone's going, yep, that's me. All right. Well, this is your job in chapter 5, verse 14, in 1 Thessalonians. We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. You know what warning is? Defense, <laughs> right? You're going out of bounds, right? You're going, getting too close to walking contrary to the truth. You're defending truth, protecting it, guarding it. So warning the unruly. right? Warning is something you do if you know where the lines are at. You are, what's it say in the verse, comforting the feeble-minded? Feeble-minded, that's, that's the leaf shaking in the wind. There's still a leaf on the tree. There's still a branch there. There's not a big one. But every part of the body is necessary, if for nothing else, to give you something to do to comfort them. Comfort, comfort is another word that means strengthen. That's what comfort means. Well, maybe we'll talk in the future. I thought it was a good idea as I was studying this lesson. I have to have a lesson on what it means to comfort someone. How to comfort someone. Okay. And the result of comforting is to strengthen someone. Because you comfort someone who's going through a time of weakness. That's why you comfort them. And there's ways to do that. It doesn't have to be with a Bible preaching lesson. But there's ways to comfort. And Paul says to comfort the feeble-minded and support the weak. That's the issue. See, the church is not only made of strong people, right? It's not that in order to rightly divide, you have to be a strong person. This isn't true at all. We're trying to be strong, but you don't walk on these doors and suddenly, you know, I'm Apostle Paul, you know. <laughs> no. None of us are like that, okay? And all of us have times of weakness. And so Paul says, warn the unruly, comfort the people minded, support the weak, and the last of all, be patient toward all men. There's something new I'm trying to do with my wife where... I used to say other things, and now I, I say when I'm confronted with an issue that I say, I, that person's teaching me patience. <laughs> I think moms and grandmas used to say, you're trying my patience, if you say that, right? right? Because I try to flip it, because it could be just something that annoys me, or I could benefit from the problem, and I could say, well, I'm learning patience right now. I haven't yet finished the quiz, but I'm learning it, because that's ridiculous, you know, and you start learning patience. But Paul says this is one of the things that we're supposed to bear in the spirit long suffering, right? Be patient toward all men. Because as you do ministry work, there are unruly people. There are feeble minded. There are weak. There are those who do not have faith. 
resist the truth. And you cannot, you should not respond in impatience. You resist the truth? How can you, you stupid idiot? You know, wait a minute. Be patient here. Okay. Support the weak, comfort the people minded, defend the faith, and do so out of patience. You know, you are not harmed by people opposing what you believe. You understand this? If you're weak in this, let me strengthen you. The truth cannot be hurt. It cannot be knocked down. The truth is the truth, whether people believe it or not. It cannot be moved. You can, but the truth can't. If you believe the truth, the truth is not harmed that you don't know the answer. The truth is not harmed that you don't know what to say. The truth is not hurt because you are lack confidence. If someone resists what you believe, it doesn't hurt the truth at all. Okay, the truth still stands. And so this is the confidence you have in Jesus Christ. Okay? Be patient. Because it takes time for people to grow. It takes time. You're just to communicate the message. And the message is what you know. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and if people are resisting parts of the truth, you can defend what you know. If you don't know, say, I don't know. I need to learn more truth about that. What you say seems to make sense. Let me, let me consider that a little bit more. Because we're all for truth here. Right? The thing about the truth is, is that it's only one side of the fence. Remember? You can't be on both sides. One thing the truth isn't is everything. You can believe whatever you want. No, that's wrong. <laughs> the truth is singular. There's one truth. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the truth. It'd be error. Look at Acts 17, or Acts chapter 9. Look at Acts 9. In evangelism, you're always doing one of these two things. If you want to know how evangelism functions, I want to know if you're moving down the road. How do I know if I'm in this car and I'm actually driving the thing? Well, if you're defending the truth and you're confirming the truth, you're doing it. So when you ask you a question, they say, well, how can you believe that? Or how do you know this? Or someone's struggling with something and they're weak and they're saying, well, I just don't know how God can intervene here. Or how, and you are starting to confirm and starting to defend. That's evangelism work. Right? You see, it's, it's, it's a lot more personal, communicating with people. Than it is the idea of, well, we need to get Billy Graham in a, crew, in, a, in a stadium and have, you know, people planted in the audience and come down and evangelistic crusade, you know. Well, <laughs> defend and confirm the truth. It can happen in that medium or it can happen with you talking to someone else. Because I know the verses, I know what I believe, I know what's the truth from the scripture, and I'm going to defend to you something that you didn't know or that you're resisting or that you're weak in. And likewise, you could be evangelized. You're in a battle, remember. Right? I've learned truth from people who aren't right dividers. <gasps> is this horrible? It's not. You know what? Because the truth is the truth. I don't care who teaches it. And, and error is error. I don't, know who, I don't care who teaches it. It's not about being this or that. It's about the truth. Right? If I hear someone say the truth, and yeah, that lines with Scripture, that's the truth. Amen, brother. Good job, Billy Graham. Why don't you do that more often? You know. <laughs> You're going to exhort the weakness there. Weakness is still weakness. But in Acts chapter 9, when Paul gets saved, Paul must have had the personality, I don't know. You know, I shouldn't say that, because when Paul got saved, the Holy Spirit dwelled in him. And he said in 1 Corinthians 15, that it's by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit that he was able to do what he did. And as we look at the apostles and say, man, those guys did great things, we should be like them. And, and that's why God gave, us, gave the apostles, to have that sort of pattern and example. But you know, the Holy Spirit dwelled in these guys. Peter was moved by the Holy Spirit to speak at Pentecost. And Paul was inspired by the Holy Ghost to write these 13 epistles. You say, that's taken away from Paul. Yeah, it's taken away from Paul and given in glory to God is what that's doing. God wrote this book. Okay. But when Paul gets saved on the road to Damascus, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he's blind, but the light blinded him. In Acts 9, down in verse 19, the scales fell from his eyes. He received sight. He arose. He was baptized. Don't ask me about that now. Ask me about it later. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. You say, what strengthened him? Well, you could say the food, and no doubt that did strengthen him. That's one way you comfort people, by the way. Food. Comfort food. <laughs> strengthened them. But he was strengthened, I don't think just with the meat, but maybe in the spirit, because it says, Then was Saul certain days with the disciples at Damascus, and straightway, verse 20, he preached Christ in synagogues, that he's the Son of God. Paul was strengthened, spent some time with the disciples. What do you think they were doing? Doing this. He goes to the synagogue in verse 20, and he starts preaching Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God. 
And he's saying, that seems a pretty simple message, Justin. Do you know how to defend the Christhood of Jesus? Of Jesus? Do you know how to, to show people that Jesus is Christ? He said, I thought his name was Christ. No, that's not his name. That's who he is. Jesus is his name. Christ is the title he holds. Christ is the person that the Jews believe in. They believe in Christ. They don't believe Jesus was the Christ. Christ, the Messiah, is something the prophets spoke about since the world began. And it prophesied after prophecy about this Christ and this Savior and what he would do. And so what Paul was doing was going to the synagogue and defending the truth that Jesus was the Christ. He had to know some prophecy. He had to know how to do that. Right? So first you believe it, then you learn how to defend it. Right? How to preach it. Verse 21, all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that which destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem? Verse 22, Saul increased the more in strength. What do you call confirmation? With strength. He increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. The more Paul was strengthened, the more he ardently defended the truth. It says here he was proving that he was Christ. Give me proof that Jesus was the Christ. I can give you proof Jesus was the Christ. We can talk about it. We had a lesson on it back in January, right? He will say, prove to me that Jesus is God. Let's do it. Let's evangelize, right? Prove to me the Bible is God's word. Let's have at it. Let's evangelize. <laughs> That's what that is. Proving it, right? Proving it with the scripture. Proving it with the gospel. Prove to me that you're saved by grace. That works. Let's evangelize. That's what you're doing. Okay. Look at Acts 17, verse 2. Acts 17, verse 2. Paul went to the synagogue and he, he proved things to them. He strengthened himself and then proved things to them. That's how he evangelized. Acts 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, his manner means this was his habit, this is how he did things, his routine. As his manner was, he went in unto them. He didn't wait for them to come to him. He went in unto them. And where did he go? He was in the synagogue of the Jews, verse 17, verse 1. He went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scripture. So he went in unto unbelieving people, those who he doesn't yet know if they're resisting or going to acknowledge it. But he goes in unto them anyway, because they're unbelievers, and he wants to engender faith with them. And he says, in three Sabbath days, that would be three weeks, Okay, three weeks, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What did he do for three weeks? Reasoned. Defended. Okay, he proved. This was his pattern. In Acts 17, verse 4, as a result of his, or, or, or verse 3 rather, when he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, he opened and alleged that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. People want to know, why is it you concentrate so much on doctrine? And how, how come you have to really take doctrine and, and, and manipulate it and start understanding every little thing, right, in the scripture about the gospel. Answer, so that I can reason and persuade and prove to other people this is the truth. Because it's not good enough to say, this is what I believe and it's just true. Well, how do you know? Well, it's just true. Why don't you believe it? Wait a minute. <laughs> how do you know it's true? Show me the verse, Right? Okay, I see that verse, but maybe you're interpreting it wrong. How do you know it's grace and not works? Doesn't God want us to do good works? Isn't God a righteous God? Doesn't he hate evil? You've got to think through these things, right? And you start growing in these things, and you start being able to respond to these things so you can defend it. And Paul starts to persuade others. We've done that for years here. The lessons we have isn't only to give you information. It's to give you information to strengthen you so you can defend it to other people. You can evangelize. As a result of his opening and alleging about the gospel of Christ, verse 4, the result is that some believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, of the chief women, not a few, but the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, what they do? Resisted the truth. You had two results. You had those who resisted it and those who acknowledged it. The fence of faith is very thin. No one sits on it. Once you hear the word, you either don't believe it or you believe it. And they don't believe it, they resisted him. Those that believed it, consorted with him. That's all there is to it. Acts 17, down in verse 16. Paul left this place because they, those who were persecuting him ran him off. While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, notice the next word, 
disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Disputation, reason, allegation, argument, and with the devout persons. Devout persons, those are people who think that they're Christians, right? Who thought they were Jews. The devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. He's talking to people, arguing with them, disputing them, reasoning with them about the gospel. Certain philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics, they brought him before the whole council that they had, their little philosophy club. He says, what is it you're preaching here? And he goes in front of them and preaches them the resurrection. And down at the end of the chapter, it says in verse 32, when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. And then in verse 34, it says, certain men clave unto him and believed. Some rejected it, some acknowledged it. But the work was done. Okay? Paul was evangelizing here. This is how whole towns heard the gospel of Christ. They heard it, only some believed. Did it by going out and evangelizing. Okay? In Acts 18, verse 4, these are Paul's missionary journeys, as people like to call them. Versus apostolic journeys. Acts 18, verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Hmm. Acts 19, verse 8. He went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. When Paul tells the Philippians, I love you guys because you, you supported me in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, he's saying, you guys evangelized with me. You guys ministered with me. And you guys know how to defend and confirm the truth. It's great to be like-minded and know other people that are saved in the body of Christ. It's even a greater joy when you have people that are strong ministering with you, defending and confirming the truth with you. It makes each other stronger. Emboldens other people. Other people become, they look at you and become more confident of God's truth working in you. Look at Romans 14, verse 1. At the fair, this next couple of weeks, and as you talk to people in the streets or wherever, you will face weak people. Okay? Your response is not to spite. <laughs> You're weak. <laughs> That's not the response. Right? Romans 14, 1, Paul says, Don't despise those that are weak. Him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful disputation. Disputation? I thought that's what Paul did to the Jews. Didn't he dispute with them and persuade them? Wasn't he defending and arguing the truth? But see, this is for those that resist the truth, that oppose it. Weak Christians aren't opposing truth. They're just weak. Paul says, receive the weak. Don't dispute with them. You need to help the seed grow, right? You don't argue against the weak. That's what you do to those who are resisting the truth. You confirm the weak. When you meet the weak at the fair, when you meet the weak in your conversations, what you try to do is find where the seed is planted. You know they've got things wrong. You know they don't understand some things. But where's that seed? Because they're not opposing truth. You believe Jesus Christ died for your sins? Yeah. There it is. Confirm it in them. Isn't that great? That Christ did everything necessary to pay for our sins. That he gave us grace. And we don't have to work forever for it because he did it all for us. You're confirming the truth in them. And that weak Christian that walked by who was kind of scared of you because you seemed like a zealot, right? You're now confirming them and you're nailing in place the truth of that gospel, which maybe they heard coincidentally at church sometime and now are being strengthened in it because, yeah, that's great. I heard that once at church and I, yeah, I think that's what I'm supposed to believe. But that guy, yeah, that's what he was telling me. So now, yeah, that is true. He said it. My pastor said it. You see how you're confirming the truth? That's how you handle the weak. You don't argue with the weak person about baptism. Right? He's not opposing truth. He's trying to grow in it. Right? You'll find some people at the fair who do oppose you. <laughs> Romans 15, verse 1 and 2, it says, We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor to his good, to edification. To the weak who want to grow in Christ, you have an opportunity, who are strong, to bear their burdens. Right? This is how you do it when they come into church, and they don't know all the truth. You know this when new people come into the church here. We draw special charts for that reason. And sometimes we'll go back and cover basic things. We don't take a test and say, do you all believe this? If you don't, get out. <laughs> we don't do that. We teach basic things again and again. And some of you at different times, you, you get confirmed in that, and you start growing in that area, and, and you get confirmed in truth. That's how that works. 
you'll meet some of these people out at the fairs. Try to confirm them. Not everyone is trying to oppose the truth. Some people do. <laughs> you'll face opposition. You shouldn't fold like a cheap card deck. You know, you'll face opposition. Expect it. There are people who don't believe, and some of them are experienced in their unbelief and will resist you. Right? You may need to be prepared to stand a little bit, to allege. In Galatians 4, 19 through 21, Paul gives the example of that. When he says to the, the Galatians here, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be forming you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. For I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? That's what he's doing here. Now the Galatians were weak, yes. They had heard the gospel, yes. But they not only did, they were opposing it. The Galatians were telling Paul, Paul, you're not right about this grace thing. We've got to keep the law. People will come to the booth and say, you're totally wrong about that tithing thing. Oh, okay. Well, you tell me how I'm wrong. We're getting ready to defend. Right? This isn't some weakling walking by who just needs to be confirmed. This is someone who's trying to oppose something, and I don't care about the tithing thing. I want to know first if they're saved. I want to know why they think it's wrong. And actually, people just don't know what to say and respond to this. But People just want to attack. One guy stood there for 10 minutes talking to me, telling me that I was wrong to put the word Bible on my sign because we don't have to believe a book, right? We believe, believe Jesus. We believe the Spirit. I kept trying to tell him, well, how do you know that without the Bible? I'm defending the truth. You can't know without the Bible. It's a defense, right? I'm arguing with him, right? Not trying to tear him down, trying to win the argument, but trying to defend the truth because he's opposing it, you see? So you have to make that discernment, that judgment. And Paul to the Galatians, as they oppose the truth, he's saying, tell me. Go ahead, tell me. You desire to be under the law. What does the law say? See, Paul already knows the answer. He knows where he's going. This is how you, this is how you defend it. Oh, you're not a Christian. Why not? Oh, it's just fables and make-believe. Oh, really? Well, what's your final authority? What's your Savior? Savior, what are you talking about? Yeah, how do you solve your problems in your life, huh? What's the ultimate authority of truth in your experience? Not, I'm putting them on the defensive, right? Ask the same questions that you had to ask to learn the truth, that we ask here. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul says to the Corinthians, I knew nothing save Christ and crucified to you. He wants to establish Christ and crucified in the Corinthians so they can face the opposition of anything else. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, in his last epistle before he dies, he tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. He says, because I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Well, we studied today what that is. The work of an evangelist is defending the truth and confirming it. We need more evangelists. Some of you may be saying, well, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a pastor. I can't do what you're doing up there. Well, fine. This is one function in the church. Another thing that needs to be done in the church is evangelism, and everyone needs to do it, but it requires you to be able to defend and confirm truth. You can study this out and defend it and confirm it. You're doing a good work. And as people get saved, you say, hey, there's a church right down the road that teaches right doctrine. What an amazing opportunity. <laughs> right? Or proclaim Christ. A lot more proclamation of Christ happens in evangelism work than does at churches oftentimes. Because you already know Christ, right? No one outside these walls is going to hear me preach. When you evangelize, you're standing for Christ in the marketplace. That's what we're doing. So when Paul says, I have you in my heart, that in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my grace, that's where we should be. We should be encouraging each other to have a heart to get past our fear, our insecurity, our lack of confidence so that we can defend and confirm the truth. In other people. Pray for boldness. You say, I, I, I just I'm not, don't have courage. Pray for boldness. Paul did. Paul was timid. He said, pray for me that I have boldness. Open my mouth boldly. Right? Pray so that when you pray, you can realize, I really do believe this. And this really is true. And it needs to be done. And if not me, then who? Pray for other men. Romans 10, 1 says, my heart for my kinsmen in the flesh is my desire that they might be saved. You pray for people to be saved, perhaps you'll take the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. We need more to be able to do this. Make it your work, okay? You're not the pastor, I'm not the piano player, whatever. These aren't even biblical positions to be a piano player. You need to do the work of evangelist. Make it your work. You don't get paid doing that, at least not in our assembly, right? But the payoff is huge, right? Because you're ministering Christ to people and you're growing in the process. 
So we need people to step up, and hopefully the fairs are that opportunity for you. Any questions, any comments? All right. Lord, we thank you for your grace, most of all. We thank you that it works in us. Uh, I pray that it would give us that desire, that compassion, that heart to see souls saved, because it's your will. I pray that we would have a love of the truth, so much so that we can't resist not taking opportunity when it, when it comes. That we would take opportunities to be among those that do not believe, to give a defense, to answer the questions that they all have, they think that are unanswerable. To confirm those that are weak, that are shaking in the wind of our culture, which is now resisting your truth for years. Lord, I pray that we can be those soldiers, that we can be those that are strong, that will be able to bear the burdens, that will be able to evangelize and see souls saved, to strengthen your church and to glorify you. Amen.